At this time, will you please welcome back Apostle Jeff Inglehart as he comes to minister. Good morning. Good morning. You may be seated. Glad to see all your faces here today. We have uh, we've been in a faith series called Extraordinary Faith. And how many know Extraordinary Faith happens in the ordinary? Because ordinary is in the name Extraordinary. Isn't that right? And so... We're talking about exceptional faith and extraordinary faith, and um, last week we learned about how Elijah was an ordinary man, and we want to pick up from last week and, and uh, continue it today, how Elijah was an ordinary man, and when you hear the word ordinary, you may think, what's the significance? Because ordinary, after all, is just insignificant. Isn't that right? If it's just ordinary, does it matter? Well... I'm here to tell you it matters. How many have ever bent the end of a jackknife trying to, trying to screw something because you misplaced your screwdriver? Huh? Or how many, how many have used uh, the butter knife from the drawer? Huh? You know what I'm talking about? Come on, let's get real this morning. Yeah. And you think, well, you know, this is an ordinary screwdriver, but you know what? It's extraordinary when you need to use it. And when you can find it. Now, I know there's some people here this morning that have OCD, and so you're the one that has the pegboard up in the garage, and everything is outlined. You know what I'm saying? And you can walk into that garage, and you can tell, someone's got my screwdriver. Isn't that right? And then you can be married to that other person that, you know, takes that screwdriver, but puts it in a drawer somewhere, or throws it up down, the, down in the basement or something. But I want you to know that it's the, it's the ordinary that becomes extraordinary when God uses it. That's why, that's why this morning we might be ordinary, but there's something extraordinary living on the inside of us, and it's the power of the Holy Spirit. So I like, I like what James chapter 5 verse 17 says. It says this. It says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, with the same physical, mental, and spiritual limitations and shortcomings, and he prayed intensely for it not to rain and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. He's saying that he was an ordinary man. An ordinary man. God wants to use us, ordinary people, to bring something extraordinary to an ordinary region. Isn't that right? And Elijah was a man just like us, ordinary. I like, um, I, I think about Elijah. Elijah was born 900 years before James even wrote this in the Bible. 900 years before he was even, even spoken of. And, and 1 Kings 17, chapter 17, verse 1 says this. And Elijah the Tishbite of the inhabitants of Gilead said to Ahab, who was a, who was a king who married a, a foreign princess by the name of Jezebel, and she became the queen. And the Lord God of Israel lives before whom I stand. There shall not be dew nor rain for these years except at my word. Now there's some pretty extraordinary things that we learned from Elijah's life already. First of all, we re realized that he expected the unexpected. And when we talk about expecting the unexpected, we all, all of a sudden think that the unexpected is, is oh, oh, you know, that's not good. But the truth of the matter is, God wants to take those uh oh moments in our life and he wants us to look for the unexpected. He wants us to see the unexpected blessings in our life. He wants us to ex accept the unexpected blessings. Now, I got to tell you something, just a little. I, I've, been, I've been looking for the unexpected. I've been believing for the unexpected. Even when every time I go visit somebody at the hospital, I'm believing for the unexpected. I am saying, God, I'm believing you to show up. I'm believing you to bring miracles, signs, and wonders, and healings. And also, I'm also expecting other things. I'm also expecting financial increase. Every time I get the mail, in, you know, the mail that comes through, it comes through my door. I don't have to go out to a mailbox. Isn't that wonderful? And as ever, it's coming through my door, I, I'm expecting checks an increase. Every time I get out of my car, I'm expecting increase in some form, some manner. I was telling my kids and my family, for over just the last two and a half weeks alone, I have, I have found like $37 just on the ground. I get out of my car in a parking lot, there's $10. I said, thank you, Lord. I get out of my car, I get out of my car in a parking lot, and there's $7 right there by my car. I said, thank you, Lord. You know what I mean? I, I'm, I'm walking out of a store, and I'm halfway into the parking lot, and all of a sudden I look down, and there's another $5. I'm just like, you know, everywhere I go, God, I thank you. I'm believing you for the unexpected blessings in my life. 
Now, you might think $30-some dollars is not that big of a deal, but I'm telling you what, it is to the person that doesn't have it. Isn't that right? Isn't that right? And I say, God, I thank you that you're always giving me seed to sow. You're always giving me seed to sow. Matter of fact, is there an expectation that God is going to do something in your life? Do you have that expectation that God is going to do something in your life? I want you to know something this morning. If you expect it, you'll begin to experience it. it, it it's, that same, it's that kind of same thing with, with negative thoughts. Oh, can we just go there for a moment this morning? You know, it's, it's that poor me, oh, oh my. You know, you start, you start down this road of, of thinking all these negative thoughts, and guess what? You start attracting more negative thoughts. Matter of fact, you start attracting more negative outcome in your life. But when you start thinking about Jesus Christ, you start looking at the positive. You know what I'm saying up there? When you start looking at the positive, all of a sudden God begins to show you and reveal things to you that, that's shocking to you. You're beginning to experience the unbelievable the exceptional and I like what first John chapter 5 verse 4 says it says this for whatever is born of God overcomes the world and this is the victory that he has overcome the world which is our faith you see the amazing thing is here is that word victory right there is the word Nike you know we, we see we see Nike and we think oh wow wow look at that symbol you know but Nike is a Greek word and it actually means victory And he's saying, I have given you victory in every situation of life because of your faith. Your faith brings victory into your household. Your faith brings victory on your job. Your faith brings victory in your life and in the lives of the people that are around you. Because you're believing. You have faith. Amazing. I like that. Hebrews 11, 6, of course, we all know what this, many of us know what this scripture says. It says, but without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. For those who are diligently seeking him, God's a rewarder of those. God is going to reward you because you have faith. Faith does not work in the realms of unbelief. Oftentimes, God waits for us to respond to him in faith. I like what Pastor Peter said this morning, even, even about something as simple as, as money, because how many know we, we all need it to live? We all need it to use it every day. And I think, I think how generous God is. Matter of fact, in Psalms chapter 145, 8, it says this. It says, the Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. And in the message translation, I like what it says in verses 16 and 17. It says this. It says, generous to a fault. You lavish your favor on all creatures. Everything God does is right. The trademark of all his works is love. Now, if we all serve a gracious father who's slow to anger, who's wanting to lavish great gifts on our lives, what are we waiting for? What are we expecting from our father who only gives good gifts? I'm not looking to be taken off guard. I'm looking at seeing what God has in store for me. And I know that it's never just for me. It's always for me and for others. Because God never just has you on his mind when he gives you something. He also has somebody else or other people on his mind when he brings a blessing into your life. It's amazing. God, on the other hand, is open-handed. Isn't that right? The one way we can find that if we're generous in our own life is the way that we, that we give our tithes and our offerings. It's, it's the biggest area of your life that is challenged by your giving. Why? Because it's your thoughts. It's your thoughts. It's your thoughts about money. It's your thoughts about who's my provider. And when, you're, and when those thoughts in your life get challenged, when you're in a situation where it gets challenged, you need to remember this, that it's not the money that sustains your life. It's God that is our sustainer. And I like what Psalms chapter 54, 4 says, Behold, God is my helper and my ally. The Lord is the sustainer of my soul. He's my upholder. He's the sustainer of life. And when you get that picture of God as the sustainer of your life, then everything around you starts to come in, in an order. Even your finances, they just come into order. They come into alignment because you're realizing that it's not your job that's your provider. Even though God says that he was going to bless the work of your hands. So guess what? you got to work in order to receive something. 
Isn't that right? I like, I like what, what Pastor Peter said this morning, though. It's e- even, even when these guys were on strike for, for a greater mor- moral high ground. Because really, it was, they're not just on strike just for themselves saying, we want more. They're saying, you know what? They're saying to a large company, we want you to move into alignment. We want you to be fair to your employees. And we want you to be fair and, and keep these other companies open. Do you realize that? It's not just about a strike, just about them getting more. Although I've heard so much dialogue from, from different people on both sides. I like what Psalms chapter 54 4 says, Behold, God is my helper. I love the word ally. How many are glad that God's your ally? That he's going before you to bring every mountain down, to bring every valley up, to make your path straight. That's who God is in our lives. God is saying, release to me what's in your hand so I can release to you what's in mine. And it's so much bigger. There's a scripture in Hebrews that say, matter of fact, that even the word tithe, that, that it shall continue even in the days of Melchizedek as it is today, that the tithe shall always continue. Because I, I know people get hung up on, or am I supposed to tithe in the New Testament? That's an old covenant teaching. But you know what? Melchizedek was before the old covenant. Isn't that amazing? God is saying, release me what's in your hand. I'm going to release to you what's in mine. Now, let's fast forward in our story of Elijah. We know that Elijah came, and, uh, and God spoke to him to go and speak to this king, King Ahab. He went to King Ahab, and he said, it's not going to rain for three years and six months. And they all looked at him, and the queen uh, Jezebel said, I don't know what you're talking about, because, matter of fact, I worship Baal, the god of, of, uh, of rain, and, and he's going to allow it to rain, and I don't know what you're talking about. And guess what? For three and a half years, it did not rain. Matter of fact, God brought Elijah to a brook outside of the jurisdiction of, of King Ahab. So there's a place of provision and protection. When God asks you to do something, he's going to take you into a place of provision and a place of protection in your life. And then as, as he moved in obedience, he moved in obedience and he, became, he got to that brook Cherith. And that's right there is where, where the provision came, the protection came. And the ravens came to feed him. The Bible says God sent ravens to feed him. He had the water from the brook to drink. And then the the brook started drying up because he knew that, hey, it hasn't rained. The brook's starting to dry up. And so he's like, God, this is your idea. Where do I go next? And then he sent him to a widow's house. And he got to the widow's house. And and some of you might remember the story. They had a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil. And she said to the prophet, she says, I'm going to cook this up. We're going to eat our last meal. And then we're going to die. And he said, you will not die. You fix me a cake first. Give me something to drink first. You will not die. Every time you go to your cupboard, you'll have the oil that will, just, that will continue to last. And every time you go to the meal barrel to get the meal out, there's going to constantly be flour and meal for you to sustain life. She said, okay. So she did it. The next day she got up, guess what? It was there. Provision was there. The day after that, provision was there. The day after that, provision was there. The day after that, provision was there. God is the God of provision in our lives. It's not. It's not. uh, It's not even the work where we where we work. But I will say this: God uses all those things in our life to be a blessing to us. To be a blessing to us. Sometimes we don't think our job's a blessing unless you don't have one. Isn't that right? Sometimes we don't think our jobs are blessing until we don't have that job. And then we realize it's a blessing. And God uses that. We'll fast forward to verse 17. Verse 17. Now it happened after these things that the son of the woman who owned the house became sick. And his sickness was so serious that there were no breath of left in him. So she said to Elijah, what have I do with you? O man of God, have you come to bring me my sin to remembrance and to kill my son? And he said to her, give me your son. So he took him up out of her arms and carried him to an upper room where he was staying. He laid him on the bed, and then he cried out to the Lord and said, O Lord my God, you, you also brought tragedy on the widow who with whom I lodge. By killing her son. Isn't it amazing how we, always, how we always blame God for all the bad things in our life? All the chaos in our life? Now come on, be serious today. How many have said, God, what are you doing? I have. I said, God, what's your plan? 
Let me in on the plan. What are you doing? God's got big shoulders. He can handle it. He can handle it in your life when you ask him the question, God, what are you doing? And he stretched, the Bible says that, that this prophet stretched himself out on the child three times and cried out and said, the Lord, my God, I pray that let this child's soul come back to him. Then the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came back to him and he was revived. I want you to, I want you to underline three because three is the number of, 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 of completion, but the three is, is so much more than just that. It's, it's the number of divinity. Three times, I want you to think about it in, a, in a, just a practical sense that he didn't give up after the first time he asked. You see, there was a persistence about him, and faith is persistent. I want you to get that in your spirit today. Faith is persistent. You don't give up the first time you ask and you don't receive. Faith is persistent. He asked the second time. You don't give up after the second time you've asked and didn't receive it. You don't give up because God wants your faith to be persistent. He wants you to be persistent in your pursuit with your faith toward him. Persistent. Persistent. Notice that it says three times. Three times. And then the Lord answered him. What, God didn't hear him the first time? I believe God heard him the first time. I believe God heard him the second time. I believe God was just waiting to see his persistence, to see his faith level rise, to see if he's going to just stop. I see so many, so many times, so often I see people, they're believing, they're standing, they're believing, they're, 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 they're moving their faith along, they're seeing great things happen. All of a sudden they come to a bump in the road and all of a sudden things just begin to halt, they begin to stop. It, it's, it's like God's blessings ran out or something. They didn't. But that's what it seems like. And all of a sudden I see them, instead of pressing in, believing, I see them regressing and walking away. And even sometimes getting angry or bitter or mad because God didn't do it the way they wanted it done. How many know that you can't manipulate God? He's going to do what he wants to do. Matter of fact, the Bible says, I am that I am. I'll become whatsoever I choose. Because he's God, we're not. But that three times he cried out to the Lord, and all of a sudden that boy finally was revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, see, your son lives. Your son lives. Persistent faith causes things to live. Some of you need to hear that again. Persistent faith causes things to live persistent faith causes some things to come alive persistent faith believes for the unbelievable and they realize that only God can do this persistent faith in your life persistent faith So what we've learned so far from the life of Elijah in the last three lessons that we've done is first of all we've learned that faith expects the unexpected faith expects the unexpected he never Elijah never thought he would be expected to be asked by God to go to a king and to confront this evil woman named Jezebel he never expected that he never expected that God's provision was going to come through ravens to feed him huh he never expected those things in his life so faith what he's learned so far is faith expects the unexpected Number two, faith moves in obedience. When God asks you to do something, it might not make sense to you. But if God asks you to do it, just move out of obedience. You'll start seeing the alignment of things come into order. They'll start coming into place. Just move in obedience because it unlocks greater faith. And then this morning we learned this, that faith is persistent. Faith is persistent. You keep pressing in. You keep plugging through. You keep moving forward because faith is persistent. God will do radical things out of our love for people. That is why he withheld the rain, to get their attention and to draw them closer to himself. God intervening in the affairs of ordinary men daily. God wants to work in our lives to bring us freedom, to bring us hope, but he also wants to work through our lives to rescue the lost, 
free those who are in bondage and to eradicate poverty. You heard it. Eradicate poverty. When you think of the wealth of the nation that's in our nation alone, we have the ability to eradicate not only poverty in our own nation, but the world. Think about that. Jesus to be temporary relievers of other suffering. As we study Elijah's life, we see that, that that's what he did. An ordinary man in an ordinary town, activating his faith in God to say, what do you want me to do? I want to do it. I want to do it. Take your faith and press in. Press in to believe him for the incredible things that God has for your life. Press in to believe him for bigger and better things. Also believe him for the little things. Just start believing him. I think of this, I think for 300 years the church has preached a doctrine of cessationism. And cessationism means that that God stopped. He, He stopped the miraculous. He doesn't perform miracles anymore. The gifts are gone. All those things... And, and the church world has been preaching cessationism for 300 years. I'm living proof that God heals. God restores. Several people in this room are, are, are testimonies of God's restorative power in their life from alcoholism, from bondages in their life, freedom, amen, freedom from drugs. I mean, freedom from past, from terrible things from your past, from abuse situations. We are all testimonies and witnesses of God's miraculous power. It's still alive. It's still, he's still on the throne. He's still functioning. He's still operating. He's just saying, will you move? Will you move with me? Will you believe with me? Because God has to use you in order to bring about his plan on this this earth. But because he's given you and I a free choice and a free will, he's a gentleman. He won't push himself on you. He'll allow you to make the choice whether or not you want to be used or not. Think about that. I think of that's not, to get, that's not to get confused when we talk about the finished work of Jesus Christ. Cessationism is not talking about, is not, uh, is not talking about the finished work of Christ. Because how many know Jesus Christ has finished the work that he, that he was set forth to accomplish? Once and for all, the Bible says, for all time. And Elijah's life, we see that is what, exactly what happened. Jesus finished God's plan and rewrote our future by giving us a new covenant. I'm so glad the new covenant replaces the old. How about you? But God is still flowing and working through people's lives today. Your life and my life. Hebrews chapter 13, 8 says this. It says, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That widow, that widow saw an ordinary man in the, in the first time he came to her house. He just saw him as an ordinary man. She didn't realize that he would become the tool in her house that would bring salvation to them and also raise her son back to life. He was the ordinary tool that God used to bring those things about in his life. God is awesome. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 8 says, Jesus Christ is the same Yesterday, today, and forever. I don't know about you, but I'm glad there's no shadow of turning in who Jesus Christ is. The praise band is coming back at this time. And I'm closing with this. I'm closing with this. Faith without works is dead. How many know what I'm talking about? My question for you this morning is I want you to think about these questions, these thoughts of life for you to challenge your life today. And it's these questions. What about you? Do you believe God will work through you? Do you believe that God actually wants to work through your life? I do. Do you want to be that person that God uses to make a difference in this world? I do. Would you dare to ask God as an ordinary person and ordinary people, to use us just as God used Elijah.
in times past. Don't think that your life is insignificant or ordinary when you are the right tool at the right time and the right place for God to use you. You'll see people struggling around you trying to trying to use the butter knife in their life to try to smooth things over. And when you try to smooth things over, things aren't helping, they're not working. God wants you to be the tool that they see that reflects who he is. There'll be other people with a jackknife in their hand, cutting themselves and cutting other people around them with their words because they don't have the right tool in their hand. You are that right tool. You are that tool. I know that faith without works is dead. I know that today churches use, use, lose young people time and time again because they say, where's the adventure? They say, where's the mir- miraculous and where's the healings and, and where's this love instead of judgment? You see, God wants to use you as the tool with young people to show them God still exists. God still exists. Faith is not controlling God. God is not changing places with me. He's not changing places with you. Just because we have faith doesn't mean that you'll be able to command God to do whatever he, he, he's going to do. That's not it. It's about listening to the obedience. It's listening to him and being obedient to do what he's asked you to do. Elijah went through all these things, but God wants us to partner with him to be the people that live in an ordinary region, expect an extraordinary God to use us to use us in extravagant faith extraordinary faith that's what God wants to do in your life remember ordinary seems ordinary until you need it I know there's people coming to your mind right now when I when I talk about people at work at your job place people in your neighborhood people that need to experience Christ the love of Christ they need to experience Christ's restoration power his forgiveness, his grace. There's relatives that are on some of your minds this morning. Just be the right tool. And at the right season, they they need that tool. They're going to see you. And they're going to see Christ living in you. Because we are what the world needs. We have what the world needs, Jesus Christ. Amen? You are what the world needs. Jesus Christ, the carriers, the hope of glory. Stand up with me this morning. Our prayer response team members are coming down this morning, and some of our elders will be here to pray with you. And our prayer response team members, they're here to pray with you about whatever situation you have in life, whatever whatever that is in your life, they're here to pray with you, to agree with you. Whether it's a financial need or, or healing, I'm excited about the healings that we heard just last week when we were out at Bay Valley Resort. And heard the, the healings that are taking place. I love that. You see, we're, all of us, all of us have the ability to be tools in the hand of God, to be used by Him. Amen? Amen. I want to give you a blessing today. Father, I thank you that you blessed us on our coming in. You're blessing us on our going out and our lying down and our rising up. God, we want to be those tools that you use. We want to be the right fit at the right time we want to be at the right place at the right time so we can be utilized for your glory that we can bring fame to you Jesus that we can lift up the name of Jesus Christ and we can see all men drawn unto you that's our desire that's our hope we want to be those people of faith that trust you that act in faith for you show us how to trust you more And Lord, we thank you for a great week this week that you're going to use us 
and fathomless ways in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. God bless your week. Have a fantastic week.